Well, thank you all so much for uh, being interested in the Word of God. If you're not in a life group, uh, constantly reminding you, uh, we're going to do a better job this semester of reaching out to everyone, make sure everyone's at least connected. You don't have to come to the life group, but the life group do, does need to check on you and make sure that you feel connected. Uh, being in fellowship with one another is important for the soul. It's important uh, for uh, connectivity, prayers, and all those things. So just want to make sure that we're looked after uh, and we're checking up on one another. Uh, if you can, if you're virtually, uh, just check in. And even if you're here on the New Birth website, just check in uh, for New Birth. It just let, lets us know how many people we have watching, how many people we have engaged in this study. And I am so excited about what God is going to give us through Paul um, in the New Testament in these epistles. And so it seemed like forever. Did, did it seem like the summer was long? I mean, it, it's been a long time. I'm like, you know, you, 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 it just kind of goes by. But after a while, I was like, when are we going to have Bible study again? And so, uh, so we're so glad when the first day of school happens, because that means we're going to jump right into Bible study. And I'm so excited about some people either from the school or just personal relationships that we have, those coming out for Bible study. I want to encourage you, if you're watching, uh, make that sacrifice. And not only a sacrifice just to be in person, but also just a sacrifice for this semester. Say, I'm going to be committed. I'm going to make, uh, let's just give us a lofty goal. I'm going to make three out of the four Wednesdays. Can, can, can we, I mean, can we just, can we? Can we start somewhere? To say, uh, whether virtually or in person, I will make three. Well, it's only three Wednesdays, right? Let, let's just let's just go with two. I'm gonna make two out of the three Wednesdays, either virtually or in person. Can we can we just shoot for some kind of goal that we can do something, right? Because and it's not my it's not for me. It's not for it's not my word. It's it's God's word, right? I want you to be committed to God's word because as we see in our country and what's going on, every man is right, does what's right in his own eyes. It's, uh, it's, it's really shameful that there's, you know, the things that we have to deal with in 2022 that are demonic, uh, divisive, um, and things of that nature. And my goal as a pastor is for you to be more informed and you to be prepared to handle what the devil has for you, no matter whether you're black, white, female, male, young, old. We need to be praying around these young people uh, because the the world that they're being released into, you, you don't even have, have an idea. You, you have no idea what they're dealing with, what they're struggling with, because we're used to things. If we picked up the telephone in our house when we were growing up, my parents, they could pick up a phone and hear exactly what was going on. But now these kids, they come home and go in their room. You don't see them till in the morning. You don't know what they're doing up there. That's, that's when they sneak out and go shoot up 62 people at a school because somebody has not been checking on them. And every case that I've seen and heard, nobody was taking them to church. Folks they're going to children worship ain't shooting up schools. They just not doing it, right? So we have to get the word of God in them to combat this evil spirit that dwells in this earth realm, okay? And if you don't believe in demons, they keep on living. You probably didn't, you didn't, you have experience and you just didn't know how to identify them. That's why when we go into this word a little bit deeper, you're just like, oh, okay, so that's what's going on there. That's, that's what I'm fat fighting against, you know, because it's not against flesh and blood. And so this semester, uh, we ended with the characters last, uh, last semester, and now we're picking up with these Pauline letters uh, that Paul writes to church. And so what I love about these letters are they are God's word to how we are to conduct church business, how we're supposed to act in church, how we're supposed to treat each other in church, and what's more importantly, what is the new grace that abounds by Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, okay? Because a lot of times we forget about grace in church, right? We forget about that. People upset us. We, 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 grace is all the way out the window, right? We, get, we got we to gotta get out of our feelings and get into the book. And so we want to get into this book. So turn to the book of Romans uh, in the New, New Testament, uh, just shortly right there after Acts is the next book. 
and we're going to start there tonight in um, that first chapter. So no reason to get too far from that. Okay. So Paul identifies himself in the first, I guess we'll mess around with the first eight verses or so. There's a greeting. All right. How, how do y'all greet people when y'all write them a letter? Dear, and when's the last time y'all wrote a letter? <laughs> huh? Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's been a while, right? Yeah. You, you got a better chance if you wrote an email, right? Yeah. yeah you, when's the last time you wrote an email letter? Today? Today? Yeah, because that's how we communicate, right? And so when we look at church history and we look at how all this came about, the challenge with the church is the church is not good at showing how important she is and how valid she is and showing how true this word is, right? So the, the reason I like the Pauline letters is they are letters. They're written out. Like, and so you can see the flow of it. And so it takes it from being this big God that wants to destroy us and hurt us and, and get us in correction to a more personal thing where you see God speaking through a man to people. Because if you got a letter from somebody, guess what? I mean, y'all are used to that, right? You, you see, it, it, it greets them who it is and says, Paul, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before the prophets of the Holy Scriptures. And he rounds this out and, and gives you an idea of who he is. This is what I like about what Paul writes here. It's who he is, who he's writing to, and who gives him the authority. Those are the things. Jesus Christ gave me the authority to write, y'all. That, that, that's who sent me. Because who gives you the authority really gives you the weight in what you're saying, what you're doing, and, and what you're trying to bring to somebody, right? Like, you all work for companies. Those of you who work for companies... If you go and write a letter and you decide you're going to walk into the CEO's office, unless you are a board director, you're probably not going to be received well, are you? No, you're not going to be received well because there's a chain of command there, right? And so you have to follow that chain of command. He cuts through the chase and says, I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ, and that's who has sent me. And, and, and I've been wanting to get here. Somebody read verse 13. 1 and 13. Now I would not have you ignorant, brothers, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. He, he said, I would have came earlier, but what happened? Hmm? He was what? It, what's hindered me? I was stopped. What else? I was restricted. What else? Redirected. Can somebody say held up? Held, held up. I was held up. I, I tried to get to y'all, but I was held up. I wanted to come sooner, but was held up. How many of y'all needed Jesus to come to your aid a little bit sooner? Y'all just like, now nah, you ain't even had to put me through all that. You ain't had to take me through all that shame. All you had to do is just come on up. But but you, you, you're you not here. I, I needed you here sooner. But guess what? Weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning, right? He may not come with the old folks say. He may not come when you want him. But he'll come on time. And, and if you know him as the God that you serve, you'll know that God always comes in God time. In God time, yeah. I don't know why God want us to uh, make it through another crying night. I, I don't know why he wants to strike fear into us about our marriages or our relationships or even our health with a bad report. I don't know. We can ask him about that when we get there, but he does it all the time. He does it all the time. And, and what I like is when somebody has the boldness to tell their story about how God made it over. How I was in a car wreck and they didn't think I was going to make it through, but now I'm a deacon now. I mean, nobody in Deacon Neesmith High School thought he was going to ever be a deacon. But guess what? 
Look at him now, right? But he'll tell that testimony, and y'all heard Pastor Coleman talk about that dead end alley all the time. I, I don't have a dead end alley, but I was raised in man. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know if there are two differences on that, but when you talk about where you come from and what God did to bring you over, what if he had a came sooner? What if you lived in a big white house with a white fence? When you Would your testimony be the same? Would your effectiveness be the same? Sometimes what God has taken us through just a little while longer is so he can get the good stuff out. He can get the good testimony there. And Paul said, man, I've been trying uh, to, to get to you. I, I've been trying to get the gospel to you. And that's, that's what's so frustrating when we look at Paul and what these guys had to go through and what the women uh, of God had to go through during the time. It was challenging to come to church. It was challenging to preach the gospel. You could, let me see how I can put this. You could die. Y'all don't have that problem now. I mean, did anybody object to y'all coming to church when y'all pulled in here? I mean, did the police pull you over and say, you're not going up to church, are you? No. Why is the church not more frequently visited? Why are people not hungry for God? It seems like when, when it's an objective objection to you being near God, then you try harder to get to God. But when you have the freedom to come to God, then you reject the opportunity. We have to take advantage of the freedom that God allows us in the United States. Because when we go to other countries, they don't have that same type of freedom, okay? And so Paul is with this obstacle and it, it, of him getting uh, to the situation, and we have every right to come and worship, to serve, to sing, to do whatever we can do in the kingdom of God. And my question to us is, what's going to happen when we have that conversation with God? And he says, why did you not serve me more? Why did, why did you not make time for me? Why did you not make me, this is the word right here, a priority? See, the thing is, God's just not a priority. And, and the reason he's not a priority is because we think he always going to be there. We, and the, the, the thing is, you are right, partially right. He is going to be there. But the question is, is he going to be there for you? He was there for Saul for a season. And see, and that's the thing we forget is you can't be so caught up in your holiness that you think your holiness is forever. You, you don't, if you've never seen an Alzheimer's patient and, and what you knew before they started losing their mind, you'd be surprised at what's going on there. And it'll make you rethink things. It'll make you write some things down. It makes me, every time I'm in the presence of seeing that transition, it makes me want to go home and write letters to God. Lord, if I lose my mind, I still praise you. I still worship you. I don't care what I say. I don't care who I cuss out. And they got to call the police because I'm running around in my underwear in the neighborhood and I'm 87 years old. Lord, know right now that I worship you. And no matter what my foolish mind may say, it's for real. Have room for me in the king. Because they'll say some things, you're just like, whoo, whoo, whoo. So we have to make sure that we are prepared to know and tell God, you're my priority. That's what I share with the leadership. Make God a priority in your week. We were growing up, and that wasn't too long ago. I know you hear me say, you're just like, is he 80? No, I ain't 80. It's not that long ago. But, I mean, not that long ago, Wednesday night Bible study was full. I'm talking about 10, 15, 20 years ago. Because that's what people just knew. That's, that's what we do. That's what we do. We, we, get a, we used to call it a refill. Got to get me a refill to Sunday, right? But now we think we got so much that we don't need a refill. And that's when we let the canker worms and the locusts get there. Paul couldn't get to them on time. And that's a word for somebody right now. Delay is not denial. 
He sure got that. He came with a word. Delay is not denial. Just because you're still in your situation and God had moved that person out your way that's obstructing justice, causing you havoc at work. And many times people causing us havoc at the house, fighting within the camp. Just because God hadn't moved it out of the way yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Okay. Paul was delayed, but he showed up. Look at verse 16. I'm going to read that uh, for you. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Um, Lady Monica, can you grab my readers out of the office? I'm sorry. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Okay, that's kind of how it evolved, right? But the just shall live by what? By Live by faith, right? And so when we want to further what we turn to Habakkuk 2 and 4. Somebody turn to Habakkuk 2 and 4 in the Old Testament. Thank you. Somebody read Habakkuk 2 and 4, and then somebody also turn ahead to John 3 and 36. Habakkuk 2 and 4. First person there, read it. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by what? Faith. What is faith? Believing in God? Believing in God? Okay. Say it again. The substance of things hoped for. There's a little bit more. But not yet seen. Right? The unrealized thing, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. You don't, a child that's that got in trouble at school ain't having faith that they're going to get a whooping when they get home. Because they ain't hoping for that. Faith is the things that you're hoping for, right? He's just like, I'm just, I'm hoping my dad to get me right when I get home. I know better. I know better than this. But the, his, his faith is that daddy don't even come home. That's, the, that's, the, that's faith, the substance of things hoped for, but you don't, you don't know if he's there yet, right? So, that's scared. <laughs> yeah, that's fear. And, and that's, that's the thing that parents see. If children don't have fear in them early, early, I ain't talking about fear, scared you're going to kill them. But halfway kill them. Just, just a little bit. They just feel like they're going to a little half dead, right? So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing at how people are trying to raise children without some form of fear. Okay? Time out is not going to get it. Time out. This, the Spirit just gave me this. Time out leads to time served. That would that that would that do. Time out lead to time served. Somebody just need to feel the wrath of God. Somebody go to John 3 and 36. I guess defects be calling me. He who believes what? What is that? When you believe in the sun, what is that? Have y'all seen the sun? So what's that? Faith. That's faith, right? So that's faith. So the, the, the just shall live by faith. And the reason that we cross reference this is we understand that the word of God is all encompassing. This, this is not just one man's writing, but this is a series of men and women who have detailed this word that men have put together um, so that we can have a repetitive word of how God wants us to live. And it's just no standalone, right? And so it's a fluid response. When we go to John, the gospel according to John, and then we go to Habakkuk in the Old Testament, and we look at that, and it gives us a fluid response from heaven that can't be coordinated by any other way. There's no other way. All of this word has been corroborated, right? It's been canonized. It's been checked. It's been, it's been tossed upside down one way or the other. It's much more than this. These are the cliff notes. 
of the writings of all of the great men of God. Okay, the inspired writing of God. We want to look at this as Paul uh, gets into this and gives Romans the structure of what they need. The faith, the just shall live by what? By faith, right? And look at verse 21. I'm going to read that. Uh, Romans 1 and 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Does that sound familiar? Nor were they thankful. They just they they knew God, but they didn't thank God, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, right? To know God is not to serve God. Who is the main person that's not gonna get to go to heaven that knows God? Satan, he know God. He's like, he's trying to keep you from getting to where he gets to, doesn't get to go, right? So knowing God is, it pushes you to serving God. See, when you, when you know God, you don't, you don't mind giving towards God's commitment to his kingdom, toward his purpose. You, you know, it just, it's just not even, it's just not even a question, right? If you see anything wrong, yeah, that brings up question. But when you know God, it, nobody has to beg you to show up for Turkey Tuesday. Nobody has to beg you to show up to help at Naomi's home, to help the foster children. Nobody has to beg you because when you know God and you know the goodness of God, guess what? You, you are ready to serve him. Somebody else that knew God, Saul, he knew him. When he went in there, Saul used to try to act like he would go to the tabernacle. He tried to act like he knew what was going on, but he didn't receive the prize. And that's what we have to understand. What you are today is not guaranteed what you're going to be tomorrow. And the reason that is true, it, and as we go through this book and study and we see all the foolishness that went around, all the witchcraft that chased after Paul from place to place they went to, we are operating in a spiritual warfare in this earth realm. And our children, those of us who have children that have gone off to college, we're just like, Lord have mercy. We're so glad we got them through high school, but it ain't over. College is right there. The, the, the things that can enter their eye gates and ear gates. I, I remember some stuff I saw in college. I'm like, my eyes ain't supposed to be seeing this. I ain't going to tell you what it is. Either. But I knew it wasn't right. I was like, this right here ain't right. It wasn't right. It wasn't right. And so, but, but when those things, and that's the difference because I've always had a healthy relationship with Christ. That even if I'm acting a fool in high school, college, even as a grown man, even if I'm acting a fool, I'm always talking to God through that. I'm like, Lord, you know I'm kind of crazy. You're going to have to help me out with this, right? You're going to have to help me through this, right? And so because of that, I believe that angels were dispatched whenever my eyes saw somebody need to see. Whether somebody whispered something that I didn't need to hear, or whether there was witchcraft going against me, I, I think there were extra angels dispatched. And those who don't have that extra layer of protection, not because of how good you are, but how often you talk to God, builds that layer of protection. We've seen plenty of people raised in church, lost their mind. I'm like, how did that work? How does that work? And we're going we're gonna to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but Saul lost his mind. Look at verse 26 through 28. It said, for this reason, God gave them up to a vile passion, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what was against nature. Don't get quiet. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for another, men with men committing what is the scripture calls it shameful. 
and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind like, uh, like the old preachers used to preach, a reprobate mind. Thing, uh, Pastor Coleman preached a sermon one year uh, like Burger King. God said, have it your way. God gets to a point where if he, you don't need him, he going to back up. He's not like that psycho girlfriend in college that keeps showing up to your apartment. <laughs> He's not like them. God looking for some God chasers. He ain't chasing us. But but when you when you fall, that's why it's so important not only for worship, but what's even better, more important is fellowship with others like mine. That's why the church is so important that we're fellowshipping with those who believe that. So when you fall, somebody said, No, I ain't letting you fall. I got you. I got you. We're not going through this. We 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 we're going the right way. But when you when you when you when you're absent and you if you let that stuff build up week after week and month after month and it's a year or two years you you've never been in fellowship you've never let the Holy Spirit in, in fill you up it, while we sitting here preparing for people to come in for a worship service and you know you hadn't been in the house for such a long time that stuff can build up and guess what your your barrier your your hedge been torn down. Like Job, uh, uh, Satan said, I want to get him, but you got a hedge around him. That's what worship is, is hedge building. Serving God is hedge building. He says, women are used for unnatural things. Men with men is shameful. They didn't, uh, um, they didn't honor God. And, and, this is, and this is for all the people just like, that's Old Testament teaching. This is New Testament. Ain't nothing new under the sun. Nothing. So what we don't want to be is in a place where God turns us over to ourselves. Look at verse 29 and 31. It says, being filled. This is, this is what you, if you want to know what you're supposed to do, here go to this. Being filled with, this is unrighteousness right here. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetedness, maliciousness, Cutting folk ties up, that's maliciousness. <laughs> Full of envy, cussing at the teacher that's got 30 students and they all bad. It ain't her fault. Murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness, whisperers. Don't do it. Please don't do it. Don't make the list. Backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters. Look at me. Look what I got. Look what I bought. I'm bowling. Inventors of evil things. The wicked. You, you know all these crazy men that get these young girls and put them in a basement and keep them against their will, that's an inventor of evil things. How they keep them there for three, four years. That's them. Disobedient to parents. This thing in the same list as murderers. Ain't no levels in this. People need to read the Bible. We got to get back to the Bible. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, you say you're going to do something, you don't show up. You in the list. Unloving, unforgiving. It doesn't matter that your dad wasn't there when you were growing up. You better forgive him. Unmerciful. Who knowing the righteous judgment. These are the don't do these things if you want to know. Don't, don't try to be holding on to them Ten Commandments. It's been upgraded. <laughs> this is the expository of the Ten Commandments. He's like, don't be talking about like you ain't know. Let me spell it out for you. Chapter 2, verse, verse 4. 
or two and four? I'm going to start at three. And do you think this old man that you judge those who practice in such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Boy, that was good right there. Your good acts can't get you to repentance. I'm going to do right. It ain't. It's the goodness of of Jesus that leads you to repentance. I'm not going to spoil alert next week, but it's the goodness of Jesus. And, and how I like to look at that is when you see what Jesus did for you, when you watch um, Mel Gibson in, 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 in the crucifixion, when you watch, if you can get through it, I ain't been, to get, been able to get through it, but that one day was all I could do. I thought I was going to need a therapist. <laughs> I said I was going to be good forever after watching that. <laughs> but all have seen it. Falling short of the glory of God, right? We, we, we are selfish in nature. And so the goodness of God is what leads you to repentance. You're just like, I don't even want this mess no more. And that's what we have to talk to others who uh, are caught up in sin, whether it is in their marriage, whether it's they're single and fornicating, if they're, they're in gays, they're homosexual, whatever the case may be. We got to quit looking at what they're doing as sin and talk to, and get them to see Jesus and what he did for them. This, this, I'm just trying to tell you what he did for you. That's, and, and when they get that, then comes the submission to Christ and say, whatever you say is good. Then comes devotion and reading the word for themselves after they acknowledge that he is responsible for them. That's what gets you to a better place. See, if you get caught up in our country, what we do is we just show stuff more and more that we want people to conform to. We just show it more and more. And you ask your kids what's right. You'll be surprised at your church going kids if you ask them what's right and what's wrong. Because they see it all the time. And we're bringing them to church less and less. We're not making that effort. But we have to understand, remember, verse 6, who will, who will render to each one according to his deeds. We got to remember that Jesus is coming back again. And according to our deeds, we have to remember it takes more than being a good person. People think, I'm a good person. I don't steal from anybody. It takes more. There are deeds that people are committing against God that they don't even know because they don't know God or his word. Okay. God is the judge, but Jesus is the savior. When, when, when Paul writes this, he says, who will render to each one according to his deeds, right? And grace is the factor in all of this. And, and that's what we have to teach, and that's what we have to preach. It's about grace. You're never going to be able to get it right enough, all right? But you at least have to give it an effort to understand what God wants. Turn to Proverbs. This, when people just, they think they're going to get around. Because people, people say some of everything. Y'all ever had people calling in sick? And they don't sound sick on the phone. <laughs> we say, thou shalt not lie. <laughs> People, and, and that's what they're used to. They just, they tell people anything, but 24 and 12, it says, if you say, surely we did not know this, <laughs> does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? Does the God not know? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And, and will he not render to each man according to his deeds? You're not going to get around God. You got a better chance of getting around LeBron James than getting around God. You're just not going to outstep him. 
But grace is the factor. And, and if you say, I didn't know, it's just not, it's, it should not even be an option. And that's the scripture you should give them. That's not going to be an option. But God loves us and has grace for all of those who call on the name of Jesus. Verse 2 and 11. 2 and 11 uh, in Romans. Somebody read that. 2 and 11. For there is no respect to persons with God. What version is that? Um, King James Version. All right. I'm a hip job. Like the old hip job. There is no respect of person with God, right? New King James Version, there's no partiality with God. What does that mean? There's no favoritism, right? Is that true? Yeah. Why? Yeah, his heart was towards God. David was, there's no one who has praised God more than anyone. I don't care what y'all do on Sunday. Y'all can lay out on the floor, run through here, all that, hang it up. David and I did y'all, right? Because God looks at the heart. Go ahead, Marquis. You talking about the author of Romans? <laughs> that guy? Yeah. Bless who he want to, can use anybody. And, and people talk about David all they want. David, that child died, right? I mean, yeah, unless you'd have had a child die in front of you, don't don't knock it. He wanted that child. That child died. He had to mourn that child, and, and but it didn't stop there. His own his own son ran him out of town. Absalom gave him the business because David didn't strike fear in him when he was a young man. He should have got the he should have got the jump on Absalom, but Absalom not only ran him out, but Absalom had an X-rated TV show on the top of the castle, slept with all his concubines, nasty. So when people are just like, well, you know, God didn't really punish David. If that was you, you just think about your kids. Don't take out the trash when you tell them, do you heartbroken? Yeah, God has no respect of person. He 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 handles all of us in a way that Scripture tells us um, that a, a good father loves his children and chastises them so that they can go right. He he told David. He told him at one time when he counted the people. He said, "You go pick your own switch." So I know I know what that's like. <laughs> Husa, just a, just a flashback. He, he told David, whatever point, yeah, see, these new, these new kids, they don't know nothing about that. They don't know nothing about that. Yeah, you better bring the tree. If you don't bring something that's going to be hefty, the tree is coming next. But that's a good father. Now I ain't think that then. <laughs> But I understand that, right? So let's move on because I'm way behind. It's 740. How did it get to be 740? I'm not, I'm going through five chapters. I'm in chapter two. So it's horrible. I'm I'm way offline. But look at this. So 2 and 21. It says, You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? I want you to just let that sit right there. You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? Paul coming up in Rome, <laughs> swinging hatchets. 
He like, how can you tell them what to do? And you all out of order. See, and that's what we have to understand is in raising our children is they're going to do what we do. And it could be as simple as answering the phone and they ask to speak to Carlos Coleman. I'm like, he ain't here. You just done lied in front of them. Now they're going to lie at school tomorrow. You done raised a liar because you ain't paid no bills on time. It's the truth. They're going to do what they see us do. Every time, 100%. So we have to be prepared and not only raising children, but even in church leadership, we have to extend grace to those who are serving with us, just like we want Pastor Carlos to serve grace with us. When we forget, when we don't show, when we have something to do, we got to show the same grace to everybody else, right? Because we got to practice what we preach, okay? But people follow what they see and not what they hear. Uh, Verse 28 and 29, and even for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, or nor is circumcision that is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one out inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart and in the spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. What is the circumcision? Let's talk about that. The cutting away of the foreskin, right? And so this is what we have to understand. After Jesus passes on and starts the church, the circumcision is no longer the bar. It never was the bar. We're going to talk about it. It wasn't the bar, okay? It was an act that God asked them to do, but it did not make them righteous. And and that's what's wrong with religion versus a relationship with Jesus. Religion has bars and hoops you have to jump over. And guess what? You you think just because you jump through the hoop, everything all right, but guess what? You go right back to what you were doing. Because you thought when you got over the hoop, or, or over over that bar, then that 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 feeling, that that thing that's pulling against you, the devil pulling against you, is going to go away. But it don't. But when you got a relationship, and you got Jesus there with you all the time, guess what? It, it helps in that way. Okay. But circumcision is an act today of cleanliness. But then for Abraham, it was a sacrifice that God asked him to do. Right. Chapter 3, verse 4, certainly not indeed, God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. We only need to talk about that. Let God be true and every man else be a liar, unless he is promoting what God says, right? Verse 9 and 10, what then, are we better than they? For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin as is written. There is none righteous. No, not one. Not one is righteous. Somebody turn to Galatians 3 and 22. Just read that. Somebody with electronic Bible. <laughs> <laughs> but the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The scripture has confirmed all under sin that by the promise the faith of Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. You've got to believe. All have sinned and fallen short of the righteousness of God, which is verse what? Three and twenty-three, Romans three and twenty-three. So we, we, we I'm gonna start this this semester. This is one that you commit to memory. Romans three and twenty-three. Everybody all know that. When somebody tell you I, you wrong, Romans three and twenty-three, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All right. So you want to have that. All have sinned is a pivotal, pivotal text in all of history. 
it is inclusive to the Jews, the Greeks, everyone. It, it covers everybody. We ought to commit that to, um, to memory. That's for the people sitting on the front row, people sitting in leadership. All have seen fallen short of the glory of God, right? 3 and 25. Whom God set forth as propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Jesus' blood covers sins that were previously committed. And because of our belief in him and because of our faith, it leads to righteousness. And, and, and where we get that is we go to the fourth verse in the fourth chapter. Uh, it says, now unto him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt, right? Abra Abraham believed God and all that God has for him. And verse 11 in that same chapter, it says, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised. Abraham was, the promise was made before the circumcision. If you want to know that, go to Genesis 17 chapter. And I'm going to read that. Verses 10 and 11. It says, this is my covenant, which I shall keep. He says, you're going to be the father of many nations, as many as the sand on the seashores. And he says, and this is my covenant with you, and you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised. So when God gave Abraham the promise, the circumcision wasn't the righteousness. It was his faith in God to trust him for what he was giving him. Okay? So it, the faith is the thing that, that encompasses our righteousness. righteousness. If you believe God for what God has said about your life, you're counted as righteousness. And many times people just don't believe that God loves them that much. Or God is concerned about their situation, right? And so he, he, Abraham's faith was extended even before the circumcision. The circumcision was an outward appearance like the baptism. It was something that we did, we did to show everybody else. And then when Jesus came, that's when the baptism came around, right? Then when the church was birthed, then the circumcision goes away. Now it's the biggest fight between Peter and Paul. Paul just trying to keep certain people in leadership that's been circumcised while Paul goes away. Paul come back, get mad with him. They have church fight. They go outside. Then they come back in and tell everybody that they saved by grace. And then as soon as he leaves, Peter's just like, but we're a little bit more saved. Because <laughs> we've been cut. Right? And that's where we are in church. Because church is a place that um, um, how long you've been there means how much foolishness you can get away with. See, church is the only place that people come and, 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 and they, they seniority is in order. Got to have a seat. I remember uh, one of the biggest risks where Pastor Coleman started out at, he messed around let a new member read the announcements. Woo! That thing. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what possessed you. That thing was serious business. They were mad about that thing. Oh man! Oh yeah, yeah. It it, it was unbelievable. We, and, and I mean, it was it was just the biggest deal because people come to a place where they think that in this house, in this place, that's based on seniority. But guess what? You have to read scripture. It says the first shall be last. Don't mean you ain't going to get on. You just getting on last. <laughs> when you see the throne, you ain't going to be mad that you got in last. You just like the beauty of it is going to take your breath away. And the last shall be first. That, that's, that's, that's word. 
So we have to take on that same spirit and we're bringing people in. And when my leaders take a chance, stop by and just like, hey, we got these new people coming in. We want to make sure we love them. We get them to work. I'm all about that. I'm all about that. We got to get that work done. This, this kingdom building ain't going to build by itself. It ain't going to build by itself. And so Christ did an amazing thing. Verse 8. Romans 5 and 8. God demonstrates his own love. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died. That means his love is forward motion. That means the blood fast forwarded and caught up with our sins. And it, it, it's moving. It, it's beyond what is and covers what will be. Your great, great grandchildren's sins are covered by Jesus and they ain't even been in the womb yet. Already it's going. Man, that's man. I love when somebody do a good plan. And, and when I read this, I'm like, God, you had a good plan. You had a good succession plan for sin. And, and it says it will go in front of you. The grace of God is not finished with you, but it covers the future of you. It'll cover the you right now. It's going to cover the you next year as long as Jesus is not coming back yet. That's good news. And so when we talk about that, that's an easy conversation to have with people. But to tell, to, to start the conversation with Jesus was nailed to the cross for you. You want to come to church with us? <laughs> they like, mm, no. You got to pick up your own cross. They like, but what if I don't want to be nailed? But when you tell them that Jesus, for what you've already done, is already covered, it's simple. It's a confession. It's a trust in him. And it's so good, and that blood is so thick, and it runs so far that it's going to cover your tomorrows too. Even if we lose our minds, it'll, it'll, it'll cover us. I'm going to wrap up. I'm all out of time. This is, this is real important here, this fifth chapter, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man centered in the world, sin entered, through one man sin entered into the world. And death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. One man brought death to all men. What in the whole world? I got to read all this. I was going to skip around. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a, a type of him, which is Christ, a type of Christ, who was to come because Jesus hadn't come yet. But the free gift, check this out, the free gift is not like the offense. Boy, that's good. Ooh, that's I can't even stay in my seat. The free gift ain't like the offense. Adam messed up, but Jesus is better than Adam. What he brought to the table, you know, we get we, we get in counseling with couples and, and ladies just like, I want to know what he bringing to the table. <laughs> Let him go if you want to. He be at somebody else's table. <laughs> Folks sopping men up with a biscuit, by the way, just in case y'all didn't know. I'm going to get back to the lesson. So his free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many die, much more grace of God and the gift of grace by one man, Jesus Christ, abounds to many. Yeah, Adam messed up and many died in that. But even more, Jesus, going, his grace going to outdo Adam's mess up. The free gift outweighs everything. Verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. 
You don't have to worry about, is there enough in Jesus? It's enough there. You know, like like me, I'm riding around all the time uh, with 10 miles to go in my truck. I, I ain't even comfortable till it get down to 10. I don't know why I feel like I need a purging of the tank. But you know, we had that gas shortage a couple months ago. My go-to filling station didn't have gas. So I rode it, went down to five. Then I got to two miles. And then the, 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 the gadget read zero miles to empty. <laughs> then I called Ford a liar because I'm still rolling. <laughs> That's what it was. It was grace. <laughs> And I coasted in and cut the truck off and rolled on to the tank. I didn't want, it, I didn't want all the gas to run out because then, then it won't start. When I could see the pump, I cut it off, put it in neutral, rolled on in there. But with God, you don't have to worry about his tank stay on full. His grace is abounding. He got, he, his, 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 his pen pegged out on full. Don't even move. It just stay on foot. So Romans is an amazing look at what Jesus did. And, and he's writing to these Romans. So who killed Jesus? We all did. Who ordered the hit? The Jews ordered the hit. They found him guilty, but they didn't have the power to do any crucifixion. All they could do is lash him. And they ain't even gonna do that. But the Romans killed him. So what's so powerful about this book is when he writes to the church, he, he begins in the beginning, he says, to all of you who are in Rome, everybody, all y'all soldiers that just killed Jesus, this for y'all too. Man, when you can extend grace to the one that killed you, what a mighty God we serve. And I want us to have that same zeal about us as God continues to use us in ministry. Amen? Amen. Well, that's the first uh, get at it tonight. Come on, give God praise. And so uh, next week, we're going to jump into salvation. Uh, Romans 10, which is a very pivotal chapter in this book of Romans, uh, talks about salvation and, and how it is and the confession. We're going to end on confession. There's a lot in between that. That's what we're going to deal with next week, so don't miss that. Thank y'all so much. Give y'all a self hand for coming out. Y'all are big time. It's, it's like uh, being in a, the Cowboys Stadium in here. So many folk in here. Y'all should be in here. There's so many people in here. We we shoulder to shoulder. No. Just the one sitting next to each other. <laughs> Just. But thank y'all for tuning in as well. Thank y'all for coming out. And uh, I will see y'all next week. Let me pray us out. Father, we thank you right now for this beautiful word, God, that you have prepared for us. And Lord, we thank you that your promise is always true. And Lord, we know right now that uh, your grace extends all things. We want to be counted as righteous, God. We, we want you to be proud of us. We want you to be uh, uh, champions for us. And God, we, we want uh, for your grace to uh, shine over us, our children and our children's children. Let us preach the good news in the city, even if we're not preachers, God. If we have accepted you, our voice is relevant, that we will preach to the lost that says that Jesus Christ is coming back and I want you to be there as well. Lord, and comfort us until we're able to be together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you. Have a great night.